Hey everybody, final thoughts time for Plunderous, but before I get to that, please remember folks, this was a paid Kickstarter preview, so you should take my opinions with a grain of salt. And actually, I gotta add another caveat here, which I don't normally do. Plunderous is fairly unique in that it is a game that I am personally very involved with the development. Uh, it's being designed and published by a friend of mine, I've known him for years, and... <laughs> For the longest time, he has been after me to um, you know, play the game with him, but I've always kept it at arm's length because I wasn't interested in a 4X game. I, the extermination? No thanks. Never mind the fact that for the longest time, Plunders was going to officially be a three-player minimum game. So those were just uh, you know, complete disqualifiers for me, and I always told him so. But in spite of that, over the years, I have spent... Many, 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 many hours talking with him, uh, Andrew Scott, about other games, what Jen and I like, what we don't like, and he has always been quick to take a lot of that feedback on board because Andrew is a perfectionist. He has been sculpting and crafting this thing for ever. And um, what's interesting is uh, last month, I think, I remember it was the month before, no, I think it was last month. I finally broke down and agreed to play it uh, with him and uh, some other folks, uh, including Shay, you know, the contributor on my channel, on uh, Tabletopia because it was his birthday. I'm like, okay, it's your birthday. As a birthday present, I will actually play this game that I have no interest in playing, even though I had an interest in it because he's a friend of mine and uh, he's got a lot of passion. And I, and again, I know so much about the behind the scenes of the development of this game and a lot of what's in this final game came from me. A lot of the suggestions I have made, he has integrated into the game. But anyway, so we finally sat down and played on Tabletopia, and I was blown away. I did not expect to enjoy this game so much. Um, because the thing is, Plunderous, I know um, Andrew likes to call this a sandbox game, and I think that's a fair assessment. This is an enormous epically huge game that gives you so much freedom to go in any direction you want and do whatever you want. And um, it's actually, I'm less interested in the sandboxy nature where it gives you so many different um, levers to pull and things to experiment with and interdependencies between all these systems. Uh, Plunderous, I know, its primary focus from a design perspective is emergent gameplay. Seeing situations grow naturally out of the uh, the sessions you play that don't happen because Andrew, the designer, said, "Right, if I make this, um, if, if I make this system interface with this system and this system, that means one of these five things will happen. And if I tweak it and balance it so those are really fun, I can create a really uh, engaging experience." To be honest. That's generally what I tend to play. Steffen Feld games, as an example, feel very, um, not scripted, but feel constructed so that they are kind of intricate, delicate, um, you know, uh, interdependencies between all these systems, but they were created on purpose to interact in specific ways to get specific results. And you, as a player, uh, explore these different avenues to find all the different ways the developers have come up with to um, make a fun game. Plunders is different. Plunders is all about emergent things. So that every single time you play the game, stuff will happen that has never happened before. Because um, all these things are not designed to work together in prescribed ways to get an ideal um, you know, gameplay result. They are instead designed to um, organically come together and re create crazy, unexpected results that still all work um, within the confines of the game. And when I sat down and played it with Shay and Andrew and Greg. Um, yeah, uh, me, as a hardcore Care Bear coming into the game, radically changed the results because I was a player who was not interested in attacking, was not chasing after that, was playing this as an engine building Euro game because that's kind of what I gravitate towards. And it affected everything else. And Andrew said afterwards, a stuff happened I've never seen before and I've played this game hundreds of times. And the thing is, uh, last week, I sat down and played it with him again because he'd made some more changes and I'd finally agreed after that first one that, yeah, this game is so much fun. I had such an amazing time. Okay. I'll do a run-through for it. Uh, he'd asked me over the years, and I'd always said, no, I don't think I'm going to. But I said, yeah, I want to see this. I want to actually feel it instead of just, you know, play it on Tabletopia. And so we played it again, and 
Uh, you know, again, stuff that has never happened before, and the game evolved in completely different ways. Even though, once again, I was choosing to to play the Peacenik route, and even in the run through I just did, um, you know, you know, between two players, it was evolving in very different ways, and that I think is the greatest strength of Plunderous. It has such a strong focus on emergent gameplay, organic gameplay that is less a reflection of all. All the rules that have been designed carefully and beautifully to interact with each other, it's the events that happen in this game are more a reflection of the choices you and your friends make. And this game will take you in very unexpected directions uh, every time you play. And that's an amazing accomplishment. And something that's really very, very rare and is almost kind of counter to... Um, what you see in uh, most modern Euro-style games, where it's all about the designer having very strict control over how everything works. This is a very freewheeling game that has a life of its own, that expresses itself uniquely every time you play, and that makes it a special, special thing. Never mind the fact that, of course, it's gorgeous. Uh, you know, the production quality, um, you know, they didn't have to go the extra mile and do double layer map tiles so everything fits in snugly and doesn't slide around. And, um, you know, it comes with gorgeous miniatures of, you know, designed by, uh, uh, the, you know, or inspired by the Miko's art. That's actually really cool. And, you know, I haven't even talked about the gameplay yet and why I like it. At its heart, this game, every round, you're going to roll a few dice. And you are going to deck build to have a small deck of cards that you can use to manipulate those dice to then be able to explore, expand, exploit, or exterminate. And the thing is, there is so much in this game. If you don't want to do any extermination, this game never makes you feel like you need to do it. Because everything that you need to do, there's a half a dozen ways you can do it. Every um, time a card gives you a thing that says, well, maybe you should really try to go towards an aggressive strategy. If you don't want to, there are other things you can do to say, nope, I reject you, game. Even if you want me to fight, there are other things I can do. I can uh, sacrifice these cards for other benefits. Uh, the game gives you so much control over, um, you know, whenever you have to draw a new card. You don't just draw one and take what you get. You draw two, pick one. If you don't like them, you can jettison and replace them later. So so the game just gives you, the player, so much freedom to explore this simulation and express yourself creatively, cre creatively through gameplay. And that's cool. And now, um, I have mentioned in the past that personally, I'm not a big fan of sandbox games. Um, you know, It's why I prefer Agricola over Caverna, because Caverna just says, hey, here's a game, do whatever you want, find your own way, whereas I prefer Agricola because it gives you that hand of cards right up front that gives you a strategy, gives you a purpose, gives you a focus. And here's the deal. This, uh, you know, when I first started talking to Andrew about this uh, years ago, this was the ultimate sandboxy sandbox game. It was do whatever you want to get the 1.5 million loyalists before time runs out. That was it. Um, but over the years, I'll be honest, I think a lot of my own personal preferences have worked their way into this design because he was really interested in what I had to say. And so, another really cool thing I love about this game, even though it's so incredibly emergent, there's so many things you can do, it is very rare to see a game that offers you three unique objective systems layered in on top of a huge sandbox game. So when you start and you get these patron requests, these are a big deal, and you really want to pursue them. Um, but you know, sometimes are just quick, easy things you can do. Sometimes they're very complex, and it could really make you focus your entire game, or at least half of the game, on just achieving this one thing. But the route to achieving this is going to be tricky. But and if that weren't enough, that everybody has their own secret goals, there are public tribute goals of um, you know constantly shifting up, changing resources into other resources, and a lot of games do that. A lot of games have the whole oh, complete a recipe to get points. But this game goes above and beyond that because it's not as simple as that. Because they're multi-tiered. Yeah, you can just do this, the basic thing, get a couple points, or you can go above and beyond, push it further, and get even more stuff. So it takes that basic idea and does interesting stuff. And if that weren't enough, every time you play, there's a different collection of six milestones that are objectives in their own right. But not objectives for points, like all of these. They are instead objectives to upgrade your ship so you can become more powerful. And you know, not only are you upgrading your ship, you are upgrading your crew, which is the life's blood of this game. There are so many crew members and every time you play, um, you're going to be able to get you know different, interesting mixes of crews that combine in a million different ways. Because what's another thing I love? If you ever went back and watched my top 10 gameplay mechanisms of all time, a big one is multi-use cards. 
These are the multi-usingest cards in the entire board game industry as it stands right now. I believe the previous record was held by Stefan Feld with Bruges, where I think it was 6 or 7. You get 10, 11, 12, sometimes 13 uses out of any one particular card. And you know, and that's a, a response to, because you, know, you can always use cards to trigger this big list of different types of things. And the fact that this is such a long list of different styles of actions that reflect different uh, gameplay approaches to solving problems is already interesting. So already you can use cards for all of these things, but then on top of that, the cards generally have two or three really interesting um, elements they can do as well. Now, although when you play them, you can generally only pick one. Although sometimes, they they soup up because cards can interact with other cards. Cards can be um, um, you know improved by the quality of the uh, resources that you apply to your little nation state that you're building and all of that. And you know so you are going to find yourself over the course of the game with different cards every time you play, and the way they interact uh, is really compelling. But you know, I've been talking up till now about how the game is just so open and freewheeling and do whatever you want. This is a game of interesting restrictions as well. Uh, the, you know, because at the end of the day, this is a deck builder. It's a small deck. You'll build your deck to either six or nine cards, and eventually you'll see other crew, and you'll start firing people that you really um, valued at one point to be able to get those new, even better crew and upgrade, and because they combo better with the cards you already have. But the tricky thing is, even though you have a small deck, the, what's what even smaller is at the end of the round, if you use your entire cards to do more stuff in the command phase and they're all exhausted, you only get to bring back a few of them. And that is a deliciously agonizing decision because you are planning out your whole next round. You're, okay, well, if I bring back the Marauder, then I could do that. And you know, and your your opponents, they know, oh, he's got a Marauder. Did he recover his Marauder? Is he going to be coming after us this round? Or, you know, is he going to sacrifice his Marauder to go and claim a port or whatever? But you can't get everything unless that's how you choose to upgrade your ship so that your ship can be not about traveling faster, not about having more storage, but instead about giving you more crew. Um, and, oh man, this run-through, even though it is one of the longest run-throughs I've ever played, I did two full hours. I still have barely scratched the surface of all the things you can do. I didn't build any mechs or mines or deploy them on the board, and those are such an interesting thing, the way they uh, create the world. I mentioned that first game I played uh, a, a month or two ago. What was really interesting is, uh, in the middle of a trade, I ended up uh, oops, getting myself a, uh, a, a mech of my own which I had no intention of using, but I wanted because there was an objective that um, I could scrap the mech. So I felt, oh, somebody else built a mech. Uh-oh, this is going to be a warlike game. And he started, um, you know, ravaging the world and attacking everybody. And, um, uh, but... I ended up putting him in a situation where because I had monopolized a certain type of thing that he really wanted, he was willing to trade his entire mech to me because um, I had something that he wanted. And so we engaged in trade. And he did it um, knowing uh, that in part of the trade, we uh, signed a non-aggression uh, treaty. So that, oh, he'll give me the mech and I'll never use it. Um, however, it didn't matter, because I was never going to use the thing anyway, because I wanted that mech specifically so that I could complete a huge tribute card by destroying the mech and uh, taking out. But interesting things started to evolve. When a Care Bear is in control of the greatest destructive force in the universe, weird things start to happen. Players start to wonder, can I really be trusted to not use this because it's such an incredibly powerful tool? Did people need to vote mechs away? Um, you know, or try to destroy it? No, look, I, look I'm, I'm not bothering anybody. My mech is over here. I've just got it parked. I'm just waiting to get the rest of the resources. I complete tribute. But the whole world revolved about... What if he uses that mech? And uh, when people, and the thing that surprised me, when people started threatening, well, you know, I might just have to ban your mech, or I might have to, there's, or I might have to get rid of that tribute. I found myself saying, well, you know, if you do that before my mech is gone, it will unleash holy fire upon you. And that's coming from me. This game made me feel like a pirate. I didn't want to do it, but um, you know, it wasn't the game that was making me do that, but I found myself threatening um the that fourth X. I didn't want to do it, but if Shay had made me, I would have. And I found myself in a situation I've never been in before. And again, it, it's a reflection of this game, that it's so wide open. There are so many things that can happen. It's absolutely incredible. And man, um, let's talk about 
The council. Um, the council is one of the things that's actually... It, it's always been a part of the game. That players have the ability, over the course of the game, to vote laws out and vote new laws in. That's always been a part of the game. And it used to be uh, there were always like upwards of eight laws at any given time. And that was way too complex. And over the years, this has scaled down to where there are, at any given time, there are now three. And um, personally... I am a longtime fan of Lancaster. And when I uh, started talking to Andrew about how Lancaster handles it, because he was handling the voting in a completely different way, um, you know, Andrew was interested, but then I said, but I don't think he wanted it, and I started pitching it in a way that is actually what we have now in the game. Um, you know, I, I am not the co designer of this game, but like I said, my personal design influence is spread throughout here a lot. Um, you know, when uh, we. we started playing with that, or when Andrew started playing with that, and you realized, yes, this is it. This is unlike anything else before. It creates this amazing, raucous uh, mini-game off to the side where players are vying for influence with each other, or saying, well, I've got so much influence, I don't need you to help me vote. I am going to change this world. Because the thing is, um, as part of setup, you have three laws. Three more laws are going to replace them if nobody, if players don't necessarily intervene to change the course of the political landscape of this game. And that flux that can change the feel of the game on a dime, um, either because players let it happen or because players leverage that system. You have a mech, you're, you know, you're creating a terror, well, um... I'll go on ahead and spend one of my crew to put a ban on mechs on the board, and I think I can get enough votes to make your mech go away. Uh, is that what you want to do? Oh, um, okay, I won't do it because you're, you promised not to attack me anymore. The negotiation in this game is a huge part as well, and that was always part of the you know the, the, the breathing DNA of this game, is players constantly trying to um, parlay with each other because it's a pirate game at the end of the day. You've got something I want, I've got something you want, you want me not to do certain things. Uh, you know, there, again, the... the a simulation can blossom and expand in so many different ways because of players. But pl it's all because of players. Um, you know, even though this has a fairly long rule book, the core rules are fairly simple. You roll some dice, you use your crew to manipulate those dice, swap dice around, and use the actions of crew, and then you just sail around the Caribbean. Uh, conquering ports, fighting, uh, you know, picking up items in one place, taking them to another place there. If you want, you can play this entire game as an engine builder, or a pick up and deliver game, or a war game. And, and if you want to make that a stronger strategy, you can manipulate the rules of the game to support the style of play you want to play, unless other players, uh, unless you can't get other players on side. That's cool too. Again, it gets back to the notion that this is an organic game. This is an emergent game where you will get a unique experience every time. And I am blown away by it. Now, um, still, in spite of all that, some people might be taken back, certainly if you're watching my channel, because uh, you might uh, err towards the Care Bear like I do. And one, I can say. This is, surprisingly, a Care Bear-friendly game. In fact, like I said, by default, the game always has, you know, three specific rules. Uh, it's the ban on mechs, and the tavern size, and, uh, oh, the broadsiding. So it's kind of a little bit, you know, it, 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 the game, by default, already de-emphasizes the combat. Um, and then players, if they want, well, over the course of the game, they can change that and emphasize the combat, if that's the way they want to play, by changing the rules of the game, or working within the laws that exist. But um, the interesting thing is, the game is going to come with alternate setup scenarios. So that if you want the game to feel like a... I, no, I want this game to feel like a war game. Then, um, you know, the game will come with suggestions of how you can set those three laws up to get a radically different feeling game. If you want it all war, if you want no conflict at all, you can set that up. And so the game, because it's so big and broad and expansive, it can mold itself to fit the needs of you and yours. And that goes even further because for the longest time, this was a three-player minimum game. And the main reason Andrew always you know, resisted saying it's a two-player game is because negotiation is such a big part of the experience. And traditionally, negotiation does not work very well in a two-player game because I don't want to negotiate with you, my only opponent, because I'm always worried that I'll get the worst end of the deal. In, in a three or four or five or six-player game, yeah, even if I don't get the better end of this deal, still, you and I have traded stuff and that puts us ahead of everybody else. So you're much more inclined to negotiate. But in a two-player game, it's much tougher to pull off. But... Um, as the design has evolved, and um, you know the game has 
focused more and more on Euro-y style things, and there's so much flexibility, so many different ways you could go. Uh, you know, they found through testing, it works really well as a two-player game, and I can confirm it. And more importantly, I can confirm this is a two-player game that really works well for negotiation, and that's completely unheard of. It's very, very rare. And personally, I love negotiation in games. I mean, I absolutely adore it. Uh, wheeling and dealing... Um, because the game is, the, the simulation is so complex, it's so rich, there are so many different avenues to victory that you are pursuing at any time. Um, and, and the game is so brilliantly designed, the most powerful thing in the world, potentially, is exploring and finding all these really cool, amazing things. But you can't explore without the cooperation, because if somebody else owns that island, um, they've got to let you in. I want to explore your island. Well, what are you going to do for me? And even in a two-player game, these kinds of negotiations just naturally flow. And it's so lovely. I absolutely adore it. So there is a lot to like here. Now, it's not to say the game isn't without some problems. The biggest thing is, uh, you know, this is a game that is definitely on the longer side. I know Andrew started out originally taking a lot of inspiration from Twilight Imperium, which is famously a 6 to 10 hour game. And um, I would certainly say Plunderous is a lot shorter than that. But, you know, at the, at the higher player counts, once everybody knows the game, this is an epic game. This is probably a 3 or 4 hour game. And I, I think if you know it, even as a 2 player game, it's going to be, you know, probably cresting to 2 and a half hours long. And that's if you know the game. The first time you play the game, there is so much, so many different avenues for exploration, literally within the systems, it's going to be a long one. So that's something you got to know going in. And the thing is, you know, Andrew and I, we've talked about this over the years, and he's he leans into it and says, yeah, this is a big game. This is a huge game. This is an amazingly ambitious, uh, broad game that gives you so much, and um, it's not going to be for people who are looking for a thirty or, or a thirty to sixty minute game. This is for something where you want an epic experience that is memorable. I mean, Andrew and I are still talking about that game we played over a month ago and how it evolved. And when we played it the other day, some stuff happened that I think we'll still be talking about months from now as we continue to work on the development. Because, folks, everything that I just said up till now refers to Plunderous. Andrew, the thing that really pulled me in is about nine months or so ago, Andrew said, hey, I'm working on an expansion that turns this into a cooperative game, the Reveille expansion. Now, uh, we are trying to decide if they should, if he should list me as a co-designer on the Reveille expansion because I have, I have easily spent over 200 hours in Skype calls with him, going over how uh, all the different ways this co-op game could work, and um, yeah. It's a big reflection of me. And that has been, I gotta say, an amazing journey. I've been having so much fun doing it. So, you can learn more about that. But, um, you know, in the process of that, I have ended up putting my personal stamp on a lot of this. And that's why I said, right up front, folks, in addition to my, hey, this is a paid Kickstarter preview um, caveat, this is also a game that is, uh, you know, if, if you're trying to look for an unbiased, objective review, you're not going to get it here. This game, it's not my baby. It's Andrew's baby, but I kind of feel like a godfather to it. And I am so proud of it. Uh, you know, I, I'm just bursting at the seams. I have enjoyed all my time, even when we get into knockdown arguments. And, you know, I've had a few shouting matches over the way I think this game should be developed with him. Um, or we're just, you know, coming up with some brilliant idea that changes everything and we got to go and try that. Um, yeah, Plunderous is a great... And, again, if you understand going in that this is a big game. This has got to be one of the big... This is certainly, for my channel, the biggest, most ambitious game I have ever covered. And that includes Gloomhaven and Spirit Island and and um, you know and other really big, crazy, over-the-top games. This game dwarfs those games, or at least certainly stands in that. Um, uh, so you have to know going in that that this gives you a true. This is an epic, emergent sandbox game with. At the same time, paradoxically, a greater sense of drive and purpose with three individual unique um, objective systems woven in um, you know, a, a constantly evolving market, dice manipulation, deck building, 4X world um, stuff, you know, narrative elements, um, because you know, this is all Andrew. He has a great sense of humor and he loves working all this stuff in. Oh, I guess this reminds me of one other thing. If you have bad eyesight, uh, uh, you might have an issue with this game because 
Andrew has uh, put a lot of text on a lot of these cards, and the text has gotten small. He swears it never gets any smaller than the small text you see on a Magic the Gathering card, that that's his limiter. He doesn't want to go smaller than that, but it is something to bear in mind um, because it is so big and rich, and these cards can do so much. I remember uh, like a year ago, he took a stab at trying to iconize, you know, use icons, and it was just impossible. The, um, the pictographic language he had to come up with just could not, and it ended up being filled filled with icons instead of text, and we're like, let's just go back to text. Um, but, uh, I mean, I don't know. Folks, uh, this is the probably the weirdest final thoughts I've ever had to give, because I, at best, maybe give some suggestions to publishers. Maybe they'll take them, maybe not. But like I said, this game, uh, I swore I would never be a board game designer, and I'm not going to be. After I quit my 20 years in the video game industry designing Siphon Filter and, and Fable 2 and The Sims for console and Brink and, and Pitfall Lost, you know, lots of different board games, I swore I'm done designing. And every time I think I'm out, somebody pulls me back in. And that's what Andrew's done here, and yeah. That's plunderous, folks. So I think I'm going to stop right there and say thanks for watching the preview. Hit that eye in the top right corner of the screen to go uh, check out. Oh, one more thing I should say. Uh, I guess uh, in case you're wondering, um, I am not, I have no financial interest in this game. I Everything I've done for this is just because I like Andrew. He's a friend of mine, and I've enjoyed working with him. But if that's something you're concerned, oh, well, Rod is just saying that because he stands to make a fortune off of big sales. I'm not making a penny off of this other than the fact that Andrew paid me my normal fee to cover the game in a run-through. Just thought that should go, because I know there's some folks out there that are always, hey, why is he saying what he's saying? I'm saying what I'm saying because I love plunderous. And those are the, the uh, preview folks. Thanks for watching. Have a very nice day. Talk to you later. So long. Bye-bye.